Our revolution have blossomed. To behave shamelessly is to trample on the blood of all those who sacrificed their lives for our freedom. That is why I ask all the women present here today to refrain from wearing wide legged pants and makeup and to begin wearing longer headscarves that cover their hair entirely. If there are no questions. The meeting is adjourned. Yes? You say that our veils are too short, that our pants are indecent, that we wear makeup, etc., etc. As an art student, most of my time is spent in the workshop. In order to draw, I need to be able to move freely. A longer headscarf would make it all the more difficult. You also criticize us for wearing wide leg pants, even though they hide our curves effectively. But knowing these pants are in style right now, I pose a question. Is religion concerned with protecting our modesty, or is it just opposed to fashion? Your criticism is always directed at women, but what about our brothers? They're allowed to dress as they please. Sometimes they wear clothing so tight you can see their underwear. I just don't understand why, as a woman, you don't think I'd be affected by the sight of men in skin-tight pants, yet you're worried they'll get turned on by a few less inches of veil? School dress code is something we as students have all experienced, usually administered in a student handbook that you are either forced to sign or have no real say on, the contents of which range from the banal and reasonable to the draconian and puritanical. But from whence cometh these rules? Why do some schools have few pages of code and others have entire books? Why are some shirts allowed and others grant you a one-way trip to detention? Moreoverly, why does it seem like everything that co-opted by mainstream, normative white culture passes these checks, but nearly everything that's considered distracting, offensive, or crude seems to line up with black culture? More actively, why does it always seem that women are forced to cover up to the benefit of the men? Are we raising the next great leaders of America, or feral beasts in need of castrating? Welcome to Episode 7 of the All-American Nightmare, War of the Wardrobe. Now, dress codes have been around since the mid-1300s. Originally, they were designed for religious schooling in the Catholic Church to symbolize hierarchy, distinguishment, and uniformity. It's important to note that a dress code doesn't strictly apply to uniforms, as that would be a uniform policy, uh, like what we see in the military or in certain outfits with regalia or ceremonial jobs. However, in American schooling, the two terms are often synonymous, so I will treat them as such for this video. The first real established dress codes, as far as America was concerned, occurred in the early 1950s with school physical education uniforms, often resembling military PT outfits from the same time period with men having short athletic shorts and white t-shirts tucked in at the waist, and women sporting tennis-style skirts or polo shirts, or uh, later on, actual military shorts equal to the men's. All of which were provided by schools and maintained by students during the year, often repurposed from actual military facilities. Up until the 1990s, the dress codes in the school were fairly lax and non-existent, really, being seen as rigid and even fascist by many social groups at the time. For most schools, the social norms were more than enough to establish a bare minimum standard of what is expected to be dressed. Most teachers didn't waste time enforcing even that. This is how we're able to see concepts like the greasers in the 1950s, the long hair stoner tie-dye of the 1960s, the heavy metal punk t-shirts of the 1970s, all the way up into the 1980s. Dress code enforcement didn't actually ramp up until the 1960s in public schools, but varied from school to school and was mostly done on a person-to-person -person basis. In the late 1980s, with the end of the Vietnam era and the rise of Christian fundamentalism, dress codes began to actually receive proper support and pushing by the religious right in order to implement a moral high ground for the moral majority to work off of. We would ultimately, however, have to wait until the late 1990s to actually see a federally backed movement for schools to actively enforce true dress code policies. In the period before the 1980s, it would be quite rare to find a school beyond wealthy private schools to implement a dress code, mainly the private school uniforms, but after the civil rights era, some schools were forced to desegregate, until eventually in the 1970s, all schools were forced to desegregate. A common trend was for schools to use dress code as a sort of soft bigotry to exclude black and Latinx students that were being integrated into their schools. Demanding that students wear certain styles of clothes that were either too expensive for impoverished inner city people to purchase, clothes that were inaccessible for students of color to purchase, such as nice dress clothes that could only be purchased at uptown stores, 
or using the way that the students were forced to dress and making them walk through troubled neighborhoods to indicate to local factions that a child was going to a higher division school than local students in an attempt to sow a sort of internal conflict within the community. For more information on that, uh, look up the books Culture Code by Daniel Coyle and the book The Condemnation of Blackness by Khalil Gibbon Muhammad for more details on that particular subject. In 1996, former U.S. President Bill Clinton announced his support for the United States implementing a school uniform system. This is on the back end of cries from a very aggressive grassroots campaign by Christian fundamentalists coming out of the Reagan and Bush administrations, claiming that graphic t-shirts, low-cut jeans, short shorts, and Nike sneakers would bring about a generation of degeneracy and corrupting the youth. This was made in his State of the Union address that same year. Quote, School uniform are one step that may help break the cycle of violence, tyranny, and disorder by helping young students understand that there really counts is what kind of people they are, end quote. The fact is that most schools banned or moved away from clothing that was popular among ethnic minorities to push more heteronormative and white normative clothing choices that would fit to a sort of cultural genocide occurring. Now, while I love the tar and feather, the PTA for this, as they were the main function for moving this information into schools, their time will come, and this video is focusing on dress codes for today. All we really have to know is that the U.S. government was pushed by Christian fundamentalist groups to implement a forced dress code or mandate that schools have a dress code, but since immediate pushback occurred, the federal government kind of left it at that, leaving schools to adopt a dress code but with no standardization about how to implement it, what to call and what not to call out, and how to bring this into a context of mixed race or ethnically aligned students in moving into heteronormative schooling, or the combat, the white supremacist system that schooling had adopted for many years, was mostly left up to the wilds. So, essentially, it was a pretty bad idea started by a bunch of pretty bad people that really had no further execution than just, hey, you have to have this now. Now, by 1998, the U.S. government had demanded that all schools implement some sort of dress code and enforce that policy. However, immediately, older generations cried out about this, stating that, in one case, a lack of dress code in school being a good thing, because when they were growing up, there wasn't an enforced dress code, and everybody went along pretty well, to other groups stating that enforcing a dress code was on par with Nazi youth culture and outright fascism, and that it crushed a children's freedom of expression and constitutional right, this mainly being a cultural leftover from the Dr. Spock way of raising children. Other groups would speak up and say that these new policies would let students who are less affluent or from poor communities to be targeted and face repercussions due to economic standards beyond their control, which is rather progressive for a 1990s then. Other groups still pointed out that such a decision should be left to teachers and not parents, and that the teachers union should decide whether or not a dress code was even necessary on a school by school basis. Again, another progressive policy. And even more so, some groups claimed that there was no evidence to support the claims made by these Christian fundamentalist groups, that there were children killing each other over sneakers in high school locker rooms, and more so that these dress codes would stop that. Hey, sorry, in the original recording I forgot to give context to this. Um, a big galvanizing story among the religious right pushing for dress codes is that allegedly two kids from a... Detroit school uh, pooled together some of their money to buy some Nike shoes in 1986 and the boys I guess got into an argument and it over whose turn it was to wear the shoes and so one kid pulled out a gun and shot the other one to kind of settle the debate uh, depending on who is telling the story depends who killed who what type of gun was used whether or not they were in a rival gang whether or not they were brothers whether or not the kids were in the same gang whether or not they were cousins it basically turned into a pick your own adventure story for the time uh, and ended up getting national headlines it was also one big fat lie that came out of nancy reagan's mouth there was never any kids that shot each other in a Detroit locker room over Nikes, and the dress codes never started to fix that. Like Much like everything else that came out of the Reagan administration, it's just a complete fabrication. However, the basis for the story actually is a lot weirder. Turns out the story originated in New York, and it was in 1992, and it was two wealthy white women who were got an argument over the last of a Saks Fifth Avenue fur mink coat, and they started hitting each other with their handbags until one woman pulled out a gun and shot the other woman over the mink coat, which at the time was about 
$2,000. Uh, just to let you all know, the weapon that she used was a 38 caliber police special revolver from Smith & Wesson, uh, Model 38. So, yeah. Total lie, but just inside. Um, back to the actual broadcast. Now, this isn't to say that only women of color and men of color were affected by the school's dress code. Obviously, Latinx and Native American people were hit pretty hard by this all the same. But before we talk about that, we have to make a small side note about the Native American populations in regards to dress code. See, most indigenous students actually were able to escape a lot of the Christian fundamentalist groups in public schools because they went to schools on reservations. And while the Christian fundamentalists were pretty tyrannical and empirical at the time, they weren't crazy enough to go and try and tell Native American people how to dress. That lesson was definitely going to be some social suicide. What unfortunately happened, however, was that any students that were going to reservation schools would see their funding ultimately trickle down to nothing during the Reagan administration, and even further cut off in the 1990s as many corporate establishment politicians cut off of most of schools' funding, leaving reservation schools that were already struggling to simply sink beneath the waves. Alternatively, if children who were of Native American ethnicity went to public schools, they would face severe punishments for their dress code. There really wasn't a lot of restrictions that could be overruled if you had religious exemptions, nor if they did able to be overruled would they be recognized. So many Native American people weren't allowed to wear certain regalia, certain clothing choices, certain styles of dress or accessories. It really was a choice between co-opting yourself into the white heteronormative schools and adopting their dress code, or going to schools and reservation schools which are so poorly underfunded and falling apart to begin with that the additional weight was just simply too much for a lot of them to stay around. Basically, this is a time when generational groups really did face a lot of issues because of the right-wing policies of both the Reagan and Bush administrations. And it really does say something to a cultural genocide when you tell Native American people that our dress code doesn't allow you to wear your regalia or your garb or religiously sacred artifacts, and that when we're going to teach history, we're not going to include you in the history, we're not going to include the significance of this garb in the history, and we're not even going to talk about the generational trauma that you or your people suffered, nor the injustices done to them. So really a lot of pain that happens to Native American people, and I do have a video set upon this that we'll go into specifics coming on later on. For today, we're just going to focus on the general review of the school dress code. Uh, from that point forward, naturally, if there is a dress code, and this is a Christian fundamentalist group put together, if there is a violation of said code, there must be punishments. Violations basically range from warnings, to write-ups, to detentions, and even expulsions, sometimes for simply one offense. For while the government demanded a system of dress be implemented, they didn't really have any real way of enforcing it, standardizing it, or manipulating it to not be a detriment to students which for children that were being systemically targeted by this was all the more reason to either not come to school, to be targeted by school, or to not leave their relatively impoverished schools. And again, we're seeing that soft form of bigotry and a soft form of segregation after the desegregating policies have been implemented. It really kind of gets caught up in the nitty gritty, but it doesn't take much of an analysis to see that many of the schools were using a dress code as a sort of soft uniform policy to disenfranchise youth. And not to mention that students who have basically been victimized all their lives and come from victimized communities, being continually victimized in a place of education that's supposed to lift them up, does a long way to really disenfranchising a large group of the populace. Students of color are going to be disenfranchised out the gate, and to continue this operations down to the very way in which they express themselves is a really good way of breaking a population down and forcing them into really just a subservient position beneath white normative culture. And this, again, really ramped up in the 1980s, but once it was officially pushed in the 1990s, things took a turn for the worst. Now, by 2002, there have been no less than 107 separate cases brought to the state courts about school dress code, and around 32 of these cases ended up going to the Supreme Court. In nearly all of them involving white students or affluent students, the case was won out in favor of the students, with the schools being found in violation of several constitutional rights. Unfortunately, for students who were of color, they almost ultimately lost and never really went past uh, local or state courts. 
Dress codes have been cited for nearly everything they sought to end, though. An establishment of unfair punishment policies? Pretty much. Uh, being biased towards impoverished students? Yep. Enforcing gender roles and transphobic norms? More of a recent concept, but it still happened. There were just court cases flying all around that were essentially accusing the dress code of exemplifying the issues that it was claimed to have fixed. And the reason why it would claim to fix that is because there was a study conducted in 1998 that was basically used to justify the story. That study was later republished in 2004 and 2006, and the differences between those time periods were quite striking. To be specific, in 1998, following the backlash from the 1996 declaration, there was a study that was conducted by a private university that claimed that there was a 32% drop in student recidivism rates, truancy rates, in elementary schools, which would rise to about a 48% drop in truancy and violence rates in middle schools, and for some reason high school numbers couldn't be addressed. However, the study was very obviously touted around the webs, touted around the media, touted around magazines, as the system working. But a study in 2004 and 2006, which may I remind you is just six to eight years later, found that the original study was completely bunk. Number one, leaving out the fact that children in elementary school and middle school have their clothes bought predominantly by their parents. They haven't learned to really self-identify or to find their own way in what they like in their culture and in their niches and interests. So naturally, yeah, the kids who had their parents buying their clothes didn't seem to violate the dress code policy all that much. But the fact that they left out high school students was because while it may have decreased truancy among elementary and middle school students, almost every day high school students were violating dress code as a form of unofficial protest to the system. In 1998, the study claimed that enforcing the dress code policy also decreased violent intentions, but the 1998 study never mentioned that high school students were not corrected for socioeconomic conditions, academic bias, troubled neighborhoods, troubled homes, uh, nor did it consider that the study was primarily done on white, heteronormative schools. The 2004 and 2006 study blew it all out of the water. Turns out that when you basically tell students what they can and cannot wear, students become increasingly rebellious. Uh, many students just found new ways to wear jewelry or wear clothes that wouldn't necessarily violate the dress code because there was no laws put to it. And ultimately that when you force students to all wear similar clothes and they can't identify in certain neighborhoods, the amount of violence skyrockets as there was one school in, I do believe, Compton, that in order to curb gang violence required all students to wear a white shirt or white button-up shirt and a sort of blue jeans, which unfortunately caused numerous gang activities to occur basing themselves around these uniforms. Students would find new ways to identify wearing the colors of the local gangs, they would find ways of identifying themselves, and students that were caught being allies with each other while wearing their dress code, but then when they get out of school and put on their colors, find out the person you're just talking to was from a rival gang, and this actually increased violent incidences. Not to mention that when it came down to students, most of the dress code was issued around women and women-centric clothing, but men seemed to violate the dress code almost four times as likely as women in the open to severely decrease punishments at the outset. More on that later. Another interesting point that the 2004-2006 study brought up that the 1998 study never even accounted for was the fact that restricting children's chances to self-identify or personalize their clothing accidentally led to violent episodes but raised chances for depression, it did increase students' uh, creativity in art classes, and even students in terms of being happy and bright-eyed by their teachers upon having the dress code implemented seemed to kind of shrink away and not want to personalize themselves. In fact, some students took this to an extreme, not being able to outwardly identify themselves with a niche or group, and deciding to switch to different outlets to exemplify their means, which caused schools to become increasingly concerned of certain students' mental health and mental faculties. So not only was this issue disproportionately affecting students of color and also causing students to become depressed, it was also putting them at risk for higher chances of violence and victimization. And the calls from the Christian conservative movement who initially implemented this were lackluster at best, since this rule wasn't really implemented in the same way that the school would implement most rules. You see, usually when a school implements a ruling on how they're going to run the school, it goes to a committee, it gets checked by the National Education Services, and then they funnel it out into the initial schooling. 
The problem with the dress code is that it initially started through the PTA, which at this point in time was being used as an unofficial lobbying group by Christian conservatives to move their opinions into school where they knew they couldn't get past academics ethics boards. As a result, since the PTA thought the dress code was doing great and weren't working with the students all the time and went to predominantly suburban, middle-class schools, they didn't see the issues being faced by teachers in, say, inner-city schools or impoverished areas. So they really didn't do anything to change it, and any alterations to the dress code only would bring more alterations to the dress code the next year and further implementation. In one school in Texas, for example, the most strictest I could find during my research, the students, because of gang violence and because of this depression, their dress code wasn't laxed, it was actually increased to the point where men could wear two types of shirts in three approved colors, and one type of pants in two approved colors, and women could wear dresses of any color they wished as long as it was single or two pattern clothing. Just that same year, three students committed suicide and there was a school shooting. And if you didn't know about that, it's probably because it was Texas. But ultimately, the 2004-2006 study was able to make three specific claims about the dress code at the end of its studies. Number one, the impacts of dress code have been primarily targeted at students of color or students in impoverished communities. Number two, the impacts on students have been largely undocumented due to a lack of external regulation reporting, leading to more increases of violent episodes, more truancy, active rebellion, and greater issues of depression and mental illness among children. And three, a dress code has largely been used to victimize women over men in this study, whereas women were punished more often for smaller crimes and had more stricter codes to work within, while men had virtually no change to their overall dress, that is to say the social conduct, and that most men seemed to be not punished at all or punished quite lightly for violations of dress code equivalent to their female counterparts. Which is pretty telling about this, that only eight years into the study, it's showing that the entire dress code mantra was a complete and utter failure, but again, due to Christian conservatism and the onset of Gen X and boomers to just victimize youth culture, things stuck around for the obvious. Now that we have the initial story of dress codes out of the way, I want to get into some specific numbers that actually came about in a recent study from 2017 to 2018. This is a study that allowed for schools to opt out of a dress code in numerous states or to have an incredibly lax dress code that was very vague. The study showed that in 42.6 to 61.6% of schools, the high schools that chose to drop the dress code did drop the dress code. That means that over half of the schools at this point in time that conducted in the study were opting out of a dress code or opting for an incredibly laxed dress code at that. Basically a dress code that meets the social standards of the day. Another fact we discovered is that dress codes that offered transgender or non-binary or non-gender conforming students to dress in the gender which they preferred saw an increase in trans and non-binary students attendance. It saw an increase in non-gender uh, non conforming or trans uh, applications in school. They were more likely to join up with clubs. They were more likely to turn their assignments on time. They were doing better in school. Their grades were improving. And it also improved children's empathy towards non-binary and trans students in discussions with among certain classes, primarily social sciences and social studies. So that's good. Relaxing the dress code seemed to do wonders for students that kind of violate the gender norm. However, another study, the same study, also discovered that in 63 to 84% of schools where the dress code violation, excuse me, the 63 to 84% of the dress code violations in the schools targeted were conducted by the same 7 to 12 teachers. This is disregarding citations given by hall monitors or equivalent staff, and these numbers also do not account for repeat citations for the same outfit in the same day. That is to say, a student gets a citation for wearing a short skirt, she goes to her next class and gets a citation for the same thing which in schooling does actually mean double punishment, but that's another issue for another day. So what we're hearing a lot of is actually not only teachers writing these violations and citations to actually keep the school going, but it's a predominantly small group of teachers doing this, which immediately for me as a former educator reads that perhaps these teachers were singling out students or perhaps these students were trying to make a protest and therefore it was uh, optimally engaged that teachers would pick this out, all the way to the point of uh, teachers have a very puritanical bent about education and want to get rid of it. Personally, I can say that I knew plenty of female teachers that did not like the idea of young, hot, uh, 
predominantly coming of sexual maturity students kind of not saying flaunting but getting attention from a lot of the guys because that's how teenagers work and in so doing a lot of these women would single out these students we also have to take into account that many women's clothing that you can typically buy in the common day are not designed to match dress code they're de designed to match fashion standards and dress code has been well known to not keep up with fashion standards of the day so there's that. And again, we still to this day have not seen a standardization of dress code. Some dress codes allow for the fingertip rule, some schools allow any type of booty shorts, some schools, like the school that I went to, had a strict dress code, but since teachers never implemented it, it was never that much of an issue, so it was really the point of, as long as we don't see your underwear, we don't really care. Now, I would like to talk for a moment about the direct correlations between dress codes and people of color, predominantly women of color. I have with me in my hand uh, a copy of an Alabama school uh, dress code form. And one of the startling things about this is that the book has two columns in size 12 font, uh, single spaced, of Times New Roman of just a list of bands, brands, and other groups that students are not allowed to have adorning their clothing. Everything from My Chemical Romance up to Black Sabbath, and even including the Teletubbies, for some reason. But I'd also like to go forward with a few other conversations. Uh, here's some points that would affect people of color. Uh, male students are not allowed to have beards, sideburns or goatees. While mustaches may be allowed, it must be fully formed and not go past the corners of one's mouth. Students may not wear do-rags, weaves, or coloring in their hair, or attach any synthetic product to their hair to elongate, and lengthen, or enhance the hair at all. Students must apply by a set of approved hairstyles, see page 17, which I don't have access to, uh, it's just a PDF. Uh, but I have a good idea that these haircuts, because there's only five allowed for men and seven allowed for women, they're probably not going to allow for nappy hair or very curly hair or afros or cornrows or weaves or waves. It's probably going to be very strictly white normative hair color. Uh, and the idea that white normative uh, hairstyles should be allowed in a dress code is incredibly invasive into a student's life. Uh, not to mention that a do-rag is a fashion accessory and a hair accessory the same as a comb or as a uh, curlers or anything else. It's not a gang affiliated item. Uh, students must also refrain from wearing any sort of jewelry, necklaces, earrings, and piercings, or facial studs. Uh, religious exemptions may only be made at the behest of parents and applied through a school board. Students may not wear hats, head covers, head scarves, or any other sort of obstructing facial wear unless religiously approved and vouched for to the school board. Uh, students may not wear reveal uh, baggy or revealing clothing of any kind. Students may not wear long, oversized coats or gowns or robes. Religious exemptions must be filed through the school board for approval. Students may not wear religiously identifiable, gang-affiliated paraphernalia or any other type of product that goes against school conduct and code of ethics policies or violates the school's Moral standard for clothing, see page 27, 53, and 54. Uh, again, I don't have those. Um, bracelets, belts, and other clothing must be plain in uh, clear sight. May not include chains, studs, or rope wear, or belt buckles, rather ironic, uh, and must not be attached to religious or paraphernalic grounds. And... Eye coverings such as glasses and contact lenses are allowed, but any type of facial veils, coverings, headdresses, or anything that obscures the face must be removed. Uh, religious exemptions must be filed through the school board. 
Clothing that depicts emblems, graffiti, or gang-related symbols or colors is not permitted. If a student is sub is, is sub uh, spized to have a shirt that contains a gang symbol or other suspicious paraphernalia, the teacher may decide the student must remove it until this until the symbol, item, or iconogra iconography is proven otherwise. So those are rules that would really only apply to people of color. And it's also quite interesting that if there is a rap artist that came out between 1973 and 2010, uh, they were in that long list of things you couldn't put on your, uh, your, your clothing. And uh, just the list of bands, brands, and iconography that students couldn't have was 12 pages long front and back. Which, adjusting for a rough translation, is almost 2,000 different things you can't have on your clothing. And I'm sorry, but no student or teacher is going to memorize that. It's mostly just shotgunning the board so you can get a student caught for any reason at any point in time. And again, none of this has been proven to be effective in curtailing students' uh, issues the dress code was claimed to. Uh, now, in recent years, there's been an increase to this dress code, uh, so far as that since students are in classes with Zoom meetings or online education where they have to kind of have a camera set up in the room to prove the student is in class, um, there has been numerous stories of students having posters, having uh, content on the background, or having some type of artwork on the wall that is considered offensive or rude or crude or crass or what have you. And in this regard, the dress code has actually been expanded in the recent years to accommodate that in a lot of schools. So it kind of just seems that the dress code is not in any way designed to help regulate students or to give them structure and discipline, but ultimately just used as a way for teachers to at any point in time punish students for any perceived slights and to victimize students of color and students that are uh, teachers have a, a personal grudge against. And this is also in line with the fact that, again, 75% of dress codes mostly appeal to women. Uh, the one I like to bring up to the fact is that do-rags, weaves, colored hair, or hair extensions, well, only really three of those would apply to a woman. And all the more so, of those three items, why are students not allowed to wear what they purchase? Certainly, hair extensions and weaves are not distracting to the basis. I mean, the whole point of a weave is that it's pretty covert. And do-rags are not a symbol of gang affiliation, but actually a way for which many people have to stylize their hair by the use of one. And this is all ultimately backed up with the idea that, as we saw in the clip at the beginning of the episode, it's distracting towards men. That really is the ultimate fallback to this. And while I would like to say that it's a pretty lackluster excuse and that everyone's kind of moved on to it, I'd like real quick to play a Sam Cedar episode, which talks about a recent principal uh, taking this concept and applying it quite liberally. To the local papers saying that the principal, a guy named George Allenbacher, <laughs> was knowingly psychologically abusing students. And so she's telling this to, I guess, uh, the local newspaper and ends up CNN picks up the story. And so Allenbacher calls her into her office and Campbell has been saying that, look, West Virginia has the ninth highest pregnancy rate in the U.S. I should be able to be informed in my school what birth control is and how I can get it. With the policy at GW under Georgia Allenbacher, Information about birth control and sex education has been suppressed. Our nurse wasn't allowed to talk about where you can get birth control for free in the city of Charleston. So Allenbacher calls the student into his office and said, I am disappointed in you. This is according to her, her relation of the exchange. I am disappointed in you. How could you go in the press without telling me? He then allegedly threatened to call her college where she's been accepted and tell them about her actions how would you feel if i called your college and told them what a bad character ha you have and what a backstabber you are <laughs> this is according to the complaint been filed uh, with the uh, circuit court where the injunction is being um filed 
According to the lawyer, we simply want to make sure that my clients and other students expressing their opinions are protected for exercising their First Amendment rights. No student should be concerned about their future for publicly expressing their opinion. Well, So now I need to address a kind of glaring point about these videos is that I really don't have any rights to speak on this. While I can serve as an info dump for this type of information, we really have to look towards women of color and people of color for their experiences on this. And for that, I've actually conducted several interviews throughout the following uh, months to kind of get a first-hand experience. Now, while I plan to put those interviews into this video proper, due to technological constraints, I wasn't able to do so. So what I've done instead is I'm going to publish the videos and the interviews as standalone videos on my channel that will also serve to kind of supplement this video, uh, which would take an essentially a four-hour video down to like a 30-minute video with several interviews to follow. Uh, that being said, I would also like it noted that the issue of women's dress codes, or really just dress codes in general, is very much a women's issue. With the concept of slut shaming originating from school dress codes and expanding on, we really do see women being the most affected at this, and therefore their voices should carry the most weight. We should look towards a lot of these student groups that are now trying to challenge the dress code and reform it, and how, while they are mostly women, it is also composed of primarily of women of color as well. So, as a white man, and as other men who watch this, I would say that we should value and give our support to these women and give our voices, or our platforms, to their voices, but we should really take a step back and allow them to kind of dictate how a proper dress code could go. And not forget to take into account for our transgender, non-gender binary, or non-gender conforming allies, that how they should have their voices heard as well, because again, the dress code does establish a very, uh, gender binary paradigm. That being said, I'd like to apologize for the fact this video took so long. I was trying out some new techniques and had to take a month off to get my uh, mental health in order, but I appreciate my fans and subscribers for sticking around and helping me to create this. I appreciate all the community members you see on screen that have also made these videos possible, and I will definitely be getting back into a more consistent video schedule from this point forward. That being said, I hope you all have a wonderful day, and thank you so much for your continued support. Telling us why you're running, sister? Because I'm late. I have class in five minutes. But you can't run like that, miss. When you run, your uh, your rear end jiggles. It's what you call immodest. Well, then stop staring at my butt!